as Jesus prepared to go to the cross, he was in an upper room with his disciples. And as we began this series, it began with Judas Iscariot leaving, going to uh, portray Jesus to the, the chief priest. And so Jesus begins his commencement address, his uh, words that he speaks to his little graduating class because they've been with him for three years and now he knows he's about to go to the cross and then very soon he will, uh, of course, be resurrected and then be with them for a period of 40 days and then ascend to the Father. And so he knows that this is a time of transition, that things are going to change, that his physical presence will no longer be with them, but he will send his spirit, and his spirit will be with them to comfort and strengthen them in the days ahead. Now, the days ahead are not going to be easy. We know that the early church went through different persecutions. We know that the head of the church in Jerusalem, James, the half-brother of Jesus, was beheaded. We know that, uh, in fact, all the apostles, uh, they spread uh, in different directions sharing the gospel. And all of them were eventually martyred, except perhaps for John. He was exiled to the island of Patmos. And so there was suffering ahead, but they had this confidence that God was with them. Jesus says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Jesus was promising them that his peace was there. And no matter what they faced, that he would give them the strength, the peace, the joy, even in the face of hardship. And my friends, those are words of promise, not just for that early band of disciples. That is for you and me, for every believer. Today, we're at part three, at home with the Spirit, John 14, 22 through 31. And then we begin with these words, then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, there were two Judases in the original 12, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And this is referring back to uh, verse 17b, the world cannot, cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. So what is he talking about? We can tend to kind of get things confused because on one hand, we know that for God so loved the world that he gave, his only begotten son. And that's one way the word, the term world is used. But it's also used in a different way. And that is the world in the sense of the human system that resists and opposes God. It is that system of uh, thinking and um, acting that... Uh, closes itself off, that resists the light. It is a sort of willful blindness. And so Jesus knows that in order to receive him, there has to be an element of receptivity, of openness, of willingness to let the light in. And so he knows that the world, in the sense of this human system that opposes God, is not like that. It uh, resists God, doesn't want to let in his truth and light. And so that's what he's talking about. Jesus re replied. Now, it's interesting. Listen to Jesus' reply. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. It's a, it's a kind of funny answer. 
Judas Iscariot, I mean Judas, not Iscariot, Judas, asked, why are you going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answers this. It's sort of indirect, isn't it? Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Jesus is saying that in order to have a relationship with God, it has to be one where there is trust and love. Just think about the relationships you have. Relationship with your family, with your spouse, with your friends. It's built on trust, isn't it? You've got to have love and trust. You've got to be pulling together, working together. And so in the case of God, who is Lord of all and who knows all things, and who is able to lead us in the way of life, that means that we love and trust him, and we obey him. Why? Because he knows the truth. He knows what's best. And it says that when we do that, when we trust and love him, he makes his home within us. Amazing, amazing thing. Father, Son, Holy Spirit make their residence within you and me. One family with one purpose and one love. So the world that opposes God is not like that. They don't have this loving, trusting relationship, but we have come to know the Lord of love. Therefore, we enter into this family and we share his purposes. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Because that is, my friends, that is the very best thing that can happen. Then Jesus continues on. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So if you don't love and trust God, then you're not going to obey him, certainly. And he's saying this is from the Father. This is at the heart of the Trinity. Um, there's this phrase I heard growing up in Texas, and that is, about a pair of mules. My mother grew up on a farm in West Texas and uh, they began, before they had tractors, with mules. And when those two mules were pulling a plow and they wouldn't cooperate, they'd say they don't jee-haw. See, G is the command for right and haw is the command for left. And when those mules wouldn't work together, when they pulled against each other, they didn't jee-haw. And that's how we are when we're trying to live with God, but we're not really cooperating with Him. We're not living in a loving, trusting relationship. It's not a, it's not a fun thing because we are living uh, as if we know what's best. We're not open and we put up different excuses, but we've got to be living in a way that we are friends with God, that we are trusting him, that we truly believe he is um, the one who knows what's best for us. And we, we follow that. We obey, obey him. So, one of my favorite quotations from a favorite author, George MacDonald, who uh, was an author, Scottish author in the 1800s. He uh, said, don't ask, do I believe or not? Ask, have I done one thing today because he said do it, or have not done one thing because he said not do it? 
So really belief is fairly straightforward. If you, we always live up to the level of our belief. We always live up to the level of our belief. If you believe something, then you're going to act on it. You're going to follow through. And so you don't have to ponder, do you believe or not? Just ask, are you willing to follow Jesus? Be his disciple. Learn from him. Do the things that he shows you to do. And when we do that, then we are certainly living in faith and believe. Jesus says, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Okay, well, just think about this. Jesus has been with them for three years, right? About three years. And he's been teaching about the kingdom of God, what it's like to live in relationship with him, the king, to follow in his way. So he's been teaching, he's been telling them things that are going to happen. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to be buried, raised back to life. They still can't grasp that at this point. Okay. Then he says, after he's raised and ascended, the Holy Spirit will be sent in his name. And last week we talked about how in his name, when you are in somebody's name, you are representing them. And so the Holy Spirit represents Jesus to us and through us. And so we'll teach you all things and we'll remind you of everything I have said to you. This morning in Bible study, we were talking about the early believers, the church at Rome. And I, I commented, they didn't have a Bible like we had. Mostly, early Christians, they would gather together, they'd share a meal together. Then they passed around scrolls. So it would be a scroll of the Gospel of John or a scroll uh, from Paul or from Peter. And they would read it out loud to the assembled people. I mean, this was before Gutenberg. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't easy to have a copy of something. Scrolls were very valuable. So they would listen to the words of Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit would remind them and would apply it when they needed it. And that's how God works in our life. We need to be reading the scripture. We need to be reading the gospels, the words of Jesus. So that he can remind us of them. You can't be reminded of something that you don't know. You got to know it first. And so, folks, the fact is, we are slow learners. We're all in the slow learner group. For these first disciples, they'd been with him for three years. They hadn't got it yet. They'd received the Holy Spirit. He would remind them of things. In other words, growth in Christ is a process. And we've got to be willing to listen to the Spirit. And when that moment comes, when we would normally do this thing, which is not so good, that little space, we allow God to remind us to do this other thing. And that, my friends, is growth in the image of Christ, becoming more like Christ. Now, if we just say, well, I'm saved. I'm not going to go through all that work. It, it, can I just take the, uh, the simple course, you know, I just get to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Jesus says that if you trust me, then you're going to follow me. And you are here on this earth to become more like Jesus. You are with him. 
He is with you by the Holy Spirit in order for you to become like Him. And so it's going to take a while. It takes a lifetime. But step by step, as we follow Him, we can grow in Christ likeness. And that's okay. That's okay. You don't have to be perfect. You see, you see our sign on the carport? Nobody's perfect. So forget about perfection. But we can be a little bit better as we follow him. And when we fall down, we get up. Because we are the presence of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, the body of Christ to the world. And then Jesus says, and remember, Within a few short hours, he will be suffering and dying for the world. Yet he says to them, peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Wow. What is different about Jesus' peace? It says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. How can a man who's about to be crucified say, don't let your hearts be troubled? Don't be afraid. It's because he knows that God is in control. And it ain't going to be easy. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he will pray and cry with drops of blood because it is so horrible. And he'll say even, Father, if there's another way, if this cup can pass for me, let's do it. But still not my will, but thy will be done. And he knows that God will take even the cross, even this most horrible of deaths, and turn it into something good so that now we wear the cross around our neck it's the most uh, recognized symbol in the world it is a symbol of hope because that that instrument of execution became the symbol of hope for the world God's peace is not based on our circumstances we tend to feel good when things are going good when there's Plenty of money in, in the checking account, you know, when nothing really bad is happening. God's peace is different. It is there because we know that God is faithful. And even when terrible things happen, we know that God is good and that he can turn things into good. And frankly, I'm like you. I don't know why uh, little children have to suffer. When I saw that picture of that father and that little uh, girl on the banks of the Rio Grande, I, I couldn't understand that, why that could happen. And when I hear of um, innocent suffering, uh, it doesn't make sense. But I know that God is good and that he is in the process of healing and putting back together this broken world, and one day it will be completely whole. Praise God. A verse I love in this vein. When you're facing suffering, remember these words from 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. When you're suffering, You've got to just hold on. And God will. He will lift you up in due time. Knowing that, you can cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's how you do it. You know that God is in control. Therefore, you hold on knowing that it might be dark for a night, but joy comes in the morning. 
Cast your anxiety, your cares on him because he cares for you. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. Well, I can imagine these disciples and they're not glad. Jesus is saying things that they would rather not hear. But Jesus is saying, it's going to be okay. In fact, there is great hope, unspeakable joy ahead. And he says, I've told you this now before it happens, before my suffering and death. And then I will ascend, I'll send the Spirit and you will experience my presence as you gather together as the body of Christ. And we experience that presence many times when we are together. That's one of the main ways we know God is with us through each other. And so he sends his spirit and we experience his presence with us that gets us through whatever we might face, the good and the bad. Jesus says, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. And then he finishes up with these words as they prepare to leave the upper room. Come now. Let us leave. He says that the world needs to learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Jesus is saying that even in the most terrible of experiences this world has seen, the cross, Jesus was faithful. Jesus held on. He was faithful even unto death. And really, what I want to submit to you is that the relationship that holds this world together, indeed all creation, everything together, is this relationship of love between the Father and the Son. You know, when you build... A skyscraper, you don't just start at ground level, do you? You dig down, and most skyscrapers, they go down five or six stories deep into the ground. And that is the footing upon which that massive hundred-story skyscraper is built. And the foundation upon which our faith is built is this love, this oneness, even unto death on the cross of Jesus and the Father. This oneness. And that gives us the faith to hold on when we go through our lives. So once again, Jesus, he starts with what we think we know, and then he tells us what it's really like. In this case, we assume that we've got to push people to do what we want them to do. But he says it's different. It's really pull with love, not push. Some things you just have to wait for uh, people to be drawn. And in this case, when people are drawn to God, when they open their hearts to God, then the light comes in. It's a relationship of love and trust. And when we love and trust and we want to cooperate with God, we want to obey. We are pulled by the love of God. We assume grace means obedience is optional. Okay, Christ died for my sins. I believe that. Can I just 
do that. But it's really, real love is expressed through our lives in action. If you are a disciple of Jesus, then you are learning from him and you are learning to do what he says. Now, you might be a young disciple. You might be a pretty poor disciple, you know. <laughs> but if you are learning to be like Jesus, then you are his disciple. And that's what God asks, that you will follow him and express it with your life. We assume character growth is optional. Many Christians think about it that way. Therefore, if they have a temper, if they, you know, are impatient, if they, you know, are gossip, they think, well, that's just the way I am, you know. That's just me. No, that's not just you. That's the way you were, but God has a plan for the way that you can be, and he expects you to grow through a process of steady transformation. And it will be maybe two steps forward, three steps back. But character growth means steady growth in Christ's likeness. And finally, we assume that peace means no troubles, peace from the storm. But Jesus teaches that his peace his peace is peace no matter what. Peace in the storm. We can know that. We can have that. And that's God's promise to you and me. It's not easy, but it's real. It is based in reality. And that reality is God himself. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for these words that you spoke to your disciples in a small upper room in Jerusalem so many years ago, just hours before going to your suffering and death. And you spoke them out of love, even knowing that you were about to die, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, we take heart that you are in control, that you can take our lives and you can transform them to be like Jesus. And that's really possible. And so this day, Lord, bless us with your Holy Spirit that we would indeed experience you at home in us. And Lord, indeed, trust you and obey to walk in the footsteps of our master as his disciples. This is.